Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod, and this is the Monday Night Review. Welcome to episode 85. Hope you're all well. It's Monday. It's going to be out on time, hopefully. Kids swimming lessons allowing. The sun is out. It was absolutely torrential here this weekend. Really vile January weather. That I think makes everyone feel a bit gross. Anyway, my husband and I uh, watched a lot of cop shows for reasons that will become apparent. So that was nice. And my mum has never had Domino's pizza before. My husband's away tonight. My mum is coming over later. We're going to have Domino's pizza. Not sure how it's going to go down. I'm not sure how much she loves pizza. Either way, I've told her it's not like pizza. It's another food group. I'm excited. I haven't had one for years. I'm assuming they're the same as they always were. It's the little things in January that get you through. Thanks to everyone who has joined the Patreon. There was a little pause with the mini-sodes last week. His last week's episode. I got sucked in to a load of research about a case that I thought I already knew everything about. Um, so there was no mini-sode, but there is one in the pipeline for this week. There's, as always, loads of extra stories and stuff. So if you haven't signed up to Patreon, go and do it treat yourself um it i love I, I love podcasts and i love audiobooks they get me through the boring parts of my day like ironing which i hate doing but if you want to sell stuff on it vinted it's all about taking those good photos and that is boring so uh podcasts audiobooks my absolute favorite and if you want mini sodes go and have a look at the patreon also, as always, I asked on Instagram stories, but please let me know. I want to know your favourite haunted places that you'd like me to cover. I've already covered my favourite, which is Hinton Ampna. I just think it's episode three, three or four, two or three. And Borley Rectory, which was one of the first stories that got me hooked. And I actually remember my mum used to take me to the library in Alton. And I would just go to, I can't even think what section it would be, but I remember... Uh, reading anything that there was about Borley Rectory, but also anything there was about vampires, which backfired, and I used to have to sleep on my parents' floor. Anyway, I digress. Today we're talking about someone who I sort of knew about in the back of my mind, but didn't know the full story of. We're going to be talking about William Palmer, who's also called the Prince of Poisons, which sounds a lot more exotic than he actually was. I think he's just a bit of an arse, but you can decide. William Palmer's born on the 6th of August, 1824 in Rudgeley, Staffordshire. I should know this. My father is from Staffordshire. He's not here for me to check the pronunciation with. And every time I saw, when I saw my mum yesterday and kept saying Rudgeley at her, she'd say, yeah, like I had gone mad, which is fair. He's the sixth of eight children to Sarah and Joseph Palmer. Now, it says here that his farmer worked as a sawyer, who's someone who cuts timber. Though, I think, considering the money that he left to his family, it's more likely that he owned a timber yard. He, When he dies, when William's 12, he leaves Sarah, his wife, a, a legacy of £70,000 pounds which is five and a half million pounds in today's money that's a huge amount so I think the fact that they say he's a sawyer which from what I can tell at this time was literally someone who cut timber for carpenters and joiners and cabinet makers I think he it, it, there's a little more to it than that Anyway, it appears that William was never a good egg. He's spoiled by his mother. Some say that he was his mother's favourite. And when he's 17, he, is, he goes off to work as an apprentice at a Liverpool chemist. But he's dismissed after only three months following allegations that he stole money. His next job was as an apprentice to the village doctor from which he was also fired from embezzlement. Now, both times, his mother swoops in, apologises, pays back the money that's disappeared, and that prevents charges from being pressed. Also, I suppose, if you're a person with that much money, you probably hold quite a lot of sway in terms of being able to cover up your son's itchy fingers. 
Um, but it wasn't just stealing that was a problem. When a fellow apprentice, I don't know who, whether this was, I'm assuming this was at the chemist, not at the doctor's, started walking out with a young lady that Palmer himself liked, he retaliated by borrowing, I'm doing inverted air quotes there, uh, by borrowing, I'm doing air quotes there, some acid from the chemist and dousing the young man's possessions, destroying them all. Which is very sinister. It's very extreme. It's not reversible. And it, I, I find it quite threatening. Anyway, it was just a hint of things to come. So he eventually goes on to study medicine at London. I believe at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And he qualifies as a doctor in August 1846 at the age of 22. It hasn't all been plain sailing though. His mother had to pay a specialised tutor to get him to pass his final exams, offering the tutor a £100 bonus if he did so. And he did it against all odds, apparently. It was looking to everyone like William Palmer was not going to pass his finals. But he did. And the newly qualified Dr William Palmer returns to Staffordshire later that same year in 1846 and on one of his nights drinking at the Lamb and Flag pub in Little Hayward, he meets up with plumber and glazier George Abley. Now, Palmer, during his time in London, had become a bit of a fan of gambling and would apparently bet on anything. So he bet Abley that he couldn't drink, that Abley couldn't drink two tumblers of brandy and Abley accepted and succeeded but then became rather ill which I guess isn't a surprise I'm thinking if I drank two tumblers of brandy in my heyday I could probably do it but oh it's not gonna make you feel great he's then later found unconscious outside the pub Again, maybe not suspicious. We don't know how much um, George Abley was used to drinking. But then he's carried home and he dies in his bed later that evening. Now, the inquest rules death by misadventure. But those who knew William suspected it could be some form of revenge. Palmer had taken a fancy to Abley's wife, who by all accounts was very beautiful, and she had rejected his advances. And some believe that Palmer had spiked his rival's drink. Palmer then returns to his hometown of Rudgley to practice as a doctor. And in St Nicholas Church, Abbots Bromley, marries 20-year-old Anne Thornton on the 7th of October 1847. Anne was the heiress to Noah's Ark hostelry in Stafford and had been warned against Palmer by her guardian and so refused his first offer of marriage. Anne's stepfather, who had brought her up, had died and her mother, by all accounts, was an alcoholic, hence why she had a guardian. Palmer continues his pursuit, he doesn't get up, and it pays off. They get married and his new mother-in-law, who some have down as being called Mary, some have down as also being called Anne, who, as I said, is an alleged alcoholic. She has inherited a fortune of £8,000 from her husband, who was Anne's stepfather, who had completed suicide in 1834. Now, £8,000 then is over £800,000 today. And Anne's mother hated her son-in-law, accusing him of poisoning her cats and suspecting that he'd married her daughter for her inheritance. Despite all this, she is known to have lent her son-in-law money. Now, in January 1849, Palmer goes to get his mother-in-law, see his mother-in-law, visit his mother-in-law, and brings her back to their house. 
insisting that she has to stay with them because when he found her, she was unconscious in an alcoholic stupor. And two weeks later, on the 18th of January, Anne Thornton Sr., Anne's mother, dies. Some, it's unapparent whether she ever regained consciousness, whether she was unconscious when she arrived. Anyway, an elderly doctor, Dr. Bamford, recorded a verdict of death by apoplexy, which is an old way of saying a stroke, which I guess covers a lot of unexplained deaths at the time. William Palmer is then disappointed with the inheritance. He thought it was going to be much larger and include Noah's Ark hostelry, though this actually goes to a cousin In her stepfather's will, Anne's marriage would invalidate her inheriting the hostelry. So it goes to a cousin that would eventually go back into Anne's line, as it were, later on. Now, Palmer is supposedly living the quiet life of a country doctor, but he's not content with possibly already being a poisoner, he has got himself a new hobby. He has started betting on horse racing. And that leads to him making friends with some people who possibly, if you're a fan of revenge and not great with money and have a bit of a problem with gambling, you're not necessarily going to meet the best people. And he becomes friends with lots of different people through horse racing and betting. And one of those people is Leonard Bladen. Now, Bladen has much better luck on the horses than Palmer. And at one point, lends Palmer £600. And he goes to Palmer's house on the 10th of May, 1850, to get repaid. He thinks that's why he's going. But sadly for him, he seems to fall gravely ill and dies at Palmer's house. Now, William Palmer claims that Bladen's death is the result of injuries received six months earlier when Leonard Bladen had been hit in the chest with a cart. Bladen's wife, though, is a bit suspicious. She'd received a letter from her husband that he'd sent on his way to Palmer's house from the races, saying that he had had a great time. He'd won around a thousand pounds and he was going to Palmer's house to pick up some money that was owed and then he was coming home and he was thrilled. So when she goes to get her husband's things she finds that he's got little money in his possession his betting books are missing meaning that there's no evidence that he's lent Palmer any money which is very convenient and she finds that her husband's death certificate lists Palmer as present at the death and that the cause of death is an internal abscess supposedly caused by this incident with the cart six months before now because palmer is a doctor that is fine that's what goes william palmer's first son william brooks palmer is born in the winter of 1848 and christened in january 1849 and he would outlive his father unlike his four siblings all of who died in early infancy So William and Anne Palmer had five children. The eldest lives. The other four die in infancy. The cause of death for each child is listed as convulsions, so some form of fit or seizure. And with infant mortality not uncommon at the time, these deaths are not initially seen as suspicious The children were between hours and months old and died at home 
so there's no medical account for their death, obviously, except for their father. And I'm guessing that if a doctor loses a baby, no one is really going to question it. You're going to think, God, how awful for that family to have lost this baby who would have been in the best hands. It's not until after Palmer's conviction in 1856 that there is speculation that he'd actually administered poison to the children to avoid the expense of having more mouths to feed. I think it's probably a fair assumption that that is what happened. Though one modern theory is that William had rhesus positive blood while his wife is rhesus negative. And if that's the case, then any of their children who were rhesus positive... Um, would have been affected by antibodies in the mother's system and suffered from severe illness. However, it seems unlikely that all four children would be rhesus positive and their symptoms did not, as far as we know, match that illness. Interestingly, also, after the fourth death, their cleaning lady quit, declaring in the local pub that the doctor was doing away with his babies and... As we know, through fact and fiction, there's not a lot that someone who regularly goes to the house, like a housekeeper or a cleaning lady, doesn't know. By 1854, 30-year-old Palmer was heavily in debt and had taken to forging his own mother's signature to pay off his creditors. He realised that something had to be done, so he takes out a life insurance policy on his wife with the Prince of Wales insurance company and pays the first premium of £750 for the policy of £13,000 and then on the 29th of September 1854 at only 27 years old the previously healthy Anne Palmer dies. She'd seemingly caught a chill that then turned to vomiting and she dies and her death is listed as cholera and, the, and and a cholera pandemic was affecting the UK at the time. It actually would cause 23,000 deaths across the country. And her husband was seemingly distraught after her death. The life insurance policy, however, didn't go that far. And Palmer was still heavily in debt to creditors to whom he owed 12,500 to one and 10,400 to another. And these creditors were threatening to speak to his mother to expose his fraud because they realised that he'd been signing cheques in her name. And so Palmer then attempts to take out a life insurance on his brother Walter for the sum of £84,000. He is, however, unable to find a comp company willing to insure Walter for that sum. Walter was an alcoholic and basically was failing all the medicals. But Palmer finds someone to dry his brother out long enough for him to pass a medical with the Prince of Wales Insurance Company, which he does. And they insure Walter just as they insured Anne. So again, Palmer pays out the premium of £780 for a policy of £14,000 and allows Walter to start drinking again. Uh, Walter gets back on the wagon, gets back off the wagon and soon basically becomes reliant on his brother to get him alcohol, who which he does. He readily surprised him with several bottles of gin and brandy every day and watches as his brother drinks himself to death. He dies on the 16th of August, 1855, and off Palmer goes to claim the insurance. However, the insurance company refused to pay up and instead dispatch inspectors Simpson and Field to investigate. They not only find that Palmer had been attempting to take out £10,000 worth of insurance on the life of George Bate, who was a farmer who had briefly been employed by Palmer, but that Palmer had insisted that Walter's coffin be sealed 
immediately before Walter's widow could see the body. And they also found it weird that Walter had named his brother rather than his wife as beneficiary. So they informed Palmer that the company would not be paying out on the death of his brother and recommended a further inquiry into Walter Palmer's death. It wasn't ending there. Palmer at the time was also having an affair with his housemaid, Eliza Tharm, who gave birth to a son, Alfred, on the 26th of June, 1855. Now, whether this child lives depends on which account you read but his presence for however long added to Palmer's financial burden though I I feel duty bound to mention there would be no financial burden if he wasn't just gambling any way any money that came on his radar and was just being a doctor that's not the path he's taken though and he's got debts spiraling out of control and so Palmer needs an another victim and he starts planning the murder of his old friend John Parsons Cook. John Parsons Cook is a sickly young man he'd inherited a fortune of £12,000 that's over £1 million in today's money which would cover Palmer's debts and then some obviously we know it would cover his debts get him through some gambling, and then he'd start to rack up some more. And from the 13th to the 15th of November, 1855, Palmer and Cook attend the Shrewsbury Handicap Stakes and bet on various horses, with Cook winning £3,000 by betting on Polestar. Meanwhile, Palmer was having a less good time. He'd received a letter from a moneylender on the morning of the 13th, threatening to expose him. He then lost heavily by betting on the chicken where Cook had bet on Polestar and generally things weren't looking good. But Cook and Palmer go and have a celebration party to celebrate Cook's wins at The Raven, a local drinking establishment. And already on the 14th of November, people noted that Cook was complaining that his gin had burnt his throat. Palmer makes a scene he attempts to convince bemused onlookers that there's nothing untoward in Cook's glass but afterwards Cook is violently sick and tells two friends George Herring and Ishmael Fisher that I believe that Dan Palmer has been dosing me on the 15th of November Palmer and Cook return to Rudgley with Cook being booked into a room at the local inn seemingly so that Palmer can tend to him as his doctor and Cook recovers from his illness and meets Palmer for a drink on the 17th of November and soon afterwards finds himself very sick again and Palmer now fully resumes fully assumes responsibility for Cook at some point it's not clear when Cook's solicitor Jeremiah Smith sends over a bottle of gin which Palmer has in his possession and the chambermaid Elizabeth Mills takes a little sip of this gin and subsequently becomes very ill. Cook is given the rest of the gin and his vomiting becomes worse than ever. Are we surprised? I'm not sure if I was really sick a bottle of gin is going to make me... I have a friend who swears if he gets a stomach bug, he puts a big shot of vodka in the freezer and then downs it and swears that that kills anything in your stomach. Um, My mother made me do it once when I was really ill. I mean, it took the edge off some things, but it didn't make me stop being sick. Anyway, so the next day, Palmer begins collecting bets on behalf of Cook, bringing home £1,200, and he goes and purchases three grains of strychnine from the surgery of Dr. Salt and puts the grains into two pills, which he then gives to Cook. On the 21st of November, not long after Palmer administers the two ammonia pills, Cook dies in agony at about one o'clock in the morning, screaming that he's suffocating. On the 23rd of November, 
William Stevens, Cook's stepfather, arrives to represent the family. He's a no-nonsense retired merchant and he takes an instant dislike to Palmer. He'd really disapproved of his stepson's lifestyle and it was clear to him that Palmer was just part of this lifestyle that he so disapproved of. Palmer informs him that his stepson had lost his betting books and he further went on to claim that they're of no use anyway, as all bets would be cancelled once the gambler dies. He also tells Stevens that Cook had £4,000 in outstanding bills. Stevens doesn't believe this. He insists that Palmer hands over the books. And when Palmer again refused, Stevens goes and requests a post-mortem and inquest, which he's granted. Meanwhile, Palmer's obtained a death certificate, again from the 80-year-old Dr Bamford, which lists the cause of death as apoplexy, again, a stroke. A post-mortem examination on Cook's body takes place at the Talbot Arms on the 26th of November, and it's carried out by medical student Charles Devonshire and assistant, who is also a student, Charles Newton, and overseen by Dr Harland. It was seen as a time for training, basically. As was usual at the time, there were numerous onlookers. It was fine to walk in and out of this autopsy. And as I said, it was a time to train people. So that opens it up to even more people. Now, there are some versions that say that um, Charles Newton, the assistant, was drunk. Others I've seen where he was just given a shot of brandy because it was his first autopsy. Some reason... Palmer is just there and allowed to interfere with the examination, I'm sure, because he is a doctor and a doctors are above suspicion. So he bumps into Newton, takes some of the stomach contents off in a jar for safekeeping. And then the jars are sent off to Alfred St. Swain Taylor, forensic expert, who we talked about in the last episode of the Alton murder. And he found that he was unable to do anything. The, the samples are so poor quality that he can't test them for anything. And so a second post-mortem has to take place on the 29th of November. But obviously, by then, if you've taken out the stomach contents that have then been taken somewhere for safekeeping, you're not going to have the same stomach contents to test. Meanwhile, Palmer also manages to persuade Postmaster Samuel Cheshire to intercept letters addressed to the coroner, and Cheshire was later prosecuted for interfering with the mail and given two years in prison. Bizarrely, Palmer then writes to the coroner himself, requesting that the verdict of death is given as natural causes and encloses in his letter a £10 note. This is ballsy, I'd say, as it's basically like sending a letter saying, I murdered this guy. Here's a tenor to keep your mouth shut. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. As far as I can tell, he has no reason to think think that the coroner's crooked in any way. And he's not. From the second autopsy, Taylor finds no evidence of poison, but states that his belief is that Cook had been poisoned. And an inquest is held on the 15th of December, with the jury delivering their verdict, stating that the deceased died of poison willfully administered to him by William Palmer. At the time, this verdict could legally be handed down at an inquest. That was fine. And the media goes wild. A doctor turned poisoner is a scandal. As I say, doctors were above suspicion. People believed that, you know, if you take that oath to save people, you can't possibly be a wrong one. But it means that every inch of Palmer's life is under scrutiny and all over the media. And it's now that he's dubbed Prince of Poisoners. A creditor has also gone to the police and says that he believed Palmer has been forging his mother's signature. And so Palmer's arrested. He's charged with murder and forgery and held at Stafford Jail. He initially threatens to go on hunger strike, but backs down when the governor tells him that that would lead to him being force fed 
Palmer's not up for that, so it doesn't go on hunger strike. Interestingly, an Act of Parliament, the Central Criminal Court Act of 1856, which is sometimes called Palm the Palmer's Act, was passed to allow the trial to be held at the Old Bailey in London and not at the Stafford Assizes. It was believed that it would be impossible to find a fair jury in Staffordshire because detailed accounts of the deaths of his children and everything were printed in local newspapers and nearly everyone in the area knew Palmer or one of his victims. Some theories hold that the reason was in fact because Palmer was popular in Rudgeley and would not have been found guilty by a Staffordshire jury. The implication being that the trial location was moved for political reasons to ensure a guilty verdict. Lord Chief Justice Campbell, the senior judge at Palmer's trial, said in his autobiography that had Palmer been tried at the Stafford Assizes, he would ne he would have been found not guilty. The Home Secretary also ordered that the bodies of Anne Palmer, William Palmer's wife, and Walter Palmer, his brother, be exhumed and re-examined. Now, Walter was too badly decomposed to test anything on and the disgusting story has it that the smell in the pub from where he was examined stayed for years but Anne was found to have antimony in her organs now antimony is a metallic poison with a similar effect to that of arsenic and is used to slowly poison victims since the renaissance times so they have definite evidence that Anne was poisoned. One month after the Palmer Act was passed, the trial begins. Palmer's defence was led by Mr Sergeant William She and started badly because she had against all rules and conventions of professional conduct told the jury that he personally believed Palmer to be innocent. The the prosecution team were shit hot. Alexander Coburn and John Walter Huddleston were great on forensics and demolished defence witnesses. They were so good that Palmer expressed his admiration for Coburn's cross-examination after the verdict. Through the racing metaphor, it was the riding that did it. Though they couldn't prove that poison was evident in Cook's body because Palmer had messed with the stomach contents, a lot of circumstantial evidence came to light which made up for this lack of medical ed evidence. Elizabeth Mills, Cook's chambermaid who'd had a sip of gin, said that Cook, when he was dying, accused Palmer of murder. Obviously, also, we know that she had a sip of gin was very ill and we know that the rest of the gin was given to cook charles newton told the jury that he had seen palmer purchasing strychnine chemist mr salt admitted selling palmer strychnine in the belief that he was using it to poison a dog he also admitted that he'd failed to record the sale in his poisons book as required by law because palmer was a doctor Charles Roberts, another chemist, also admitted selling Palmer strychnine without noting it in his poisons book because he was a doctor. And Palmer's financial situation was also explained when moneylender Thomas Pratt told the court that he lent money to the accused at a 60% interest. And bank manager Mr Strawbridge confirmed that as of the 3rd of November 1855, Palmer's bank balance stood at £9. However... The cause of Cook's death was hotly disputed, with each side bringing out medical witnesses. Few medical witnesses had any experience in human cases of strychnine poisoning, and their testimony would be considered incredibly weak by today's standards. Dr Bamford was ill, and his stated cause of congestion of the brain was dismissed by other witnesses. The prosecution told the jury that... He had become mentally suspect in his old age. The prosecution witnesses, including Alfred Swain Taylor, stated the cause of death as tetanus due to strychnine. Mm. 
She summed up his case to the jury by stating that if the prosecution were correct, never therefore were circumstances so favourable for detection of the poison and yet none was found. He summoned 15 medical witnesses who stated that the poison should have been found in the stomach, though of course the contents of which had disappeared during the post-mortem. For me, the fact that Palmer took the stomach contents from Newton should be enough to end the letter. Anyway, the prosecution has the last word and an image is painted of Palmer as a man desperately in need of money in order to avoid debtor's prison. He murdered his friend for money and had covered his tracks by sabotaging the post-mortem. The trial lasted for 12 days. The jury deliberated for just over an hour before returning a verdict of guilty. Lord Campbell handed down a death sentence and there was no reaction from Palmer. Now, the legal system around capital punishment in Britain from the late 17th to early 19th century was called the Bloody Code. And the code listed more than 200 crimes that were punishable by death. Though in the 1830s, execution for anything other than murder was extremely rare. The list of 200 things includes cutting down a tree, stealing horses or sheep, being out at night with a blackened face, being an unmarried mother concealing a stillborn child and wrecking a fish pond. William Palmer, now known as the Palmer the Poisoner or, or the Prince of Poisoners, was executed on the 14th of June 1856 with approximately 30,000 people outside Stafford Prison to see him hang, some of whom had spent all night in the rain to get a good view. The executioner was George Smith, also known as Throttler Smith, and as he stepped onto the gallows, Palmer is said to have looked at the trapdoor and exclaimed, are you sure it's safe? The prison governor asked Palmer to confess his guilt before the end, which resulted in the following exchange of words. Cook did not die from strychnine. This is no time for quibbling. Did you or did you not kill Cook? The Lord Chief Justice summed up for poisoning by strychnine. Palmer was buried beside the prison chapel in a grave filled, filled with quicklime. And after he was hanged, his mother is said to have commented, they have hanged my saintly Billy. Such was his notoriety that lengths of rope sold for a guinea apiece, and there was rather more rope available than would have been needed to hang someone. A wax effigy of Palmer was displayed in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussauds Waxwork Museum from 1857 until 1979. Some scholars believe that the evidence is not enough to convict him and that the summing up of the judge was prejudicial. On the 20th of May 1946, the Sentinel published a final piece of evidence which had not been included in the trial, but was found by Mrs E. Smith, widow of the former coroner for South West London, and she found a prescription for opium written in Palmer's handwriting, on the reverse of which was a chemist's bill for 10 shillings worth of strychnine and opium. It's hard to get an exact number of Palmer's victims. It's believed to be around 15, including, but not limited to, his wife, four children, his mother-in-law, brother and John Parsons Cook. Charles Dickens, who at the time was a prominent critic of public hanging, called Palmer the greatest villain that ever stood at the Old Bailey. And that is the story of William Palmer, the Prince of Poisoners. What an awful man. He seems to just... I'd, I mean, there's a lot of people who'd be very happy being a uh, quite well-off, well-married country doctor, but this guy just seems to be not well put together mentally from the get-go. Maybe he's a very good advertisement for why it's not good to be your mother's favourite. As always, you can email me, themondaynightreview at gmail.com. You can find me on social media, The Monday Night Review, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. And as I said at the beginning, you can come and join the Patreon where you get mini-sodes. There's a forum you can chat on and ask questions on and talk about cases. 
and you get stories every week written by the amazing Holly and until next week be kind stay safe and always check the vaccine before you drive